It's an honor and a privilege to uh, be here with you all once again. If you could turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 30 through 50. Mark chapter 9 verses 30 through 50. And before uh, we get into our text tonight, I want to begin uh, with uh, prayer, and then we will go through our text. Lord, I, I pray that you would um, bless the uh, teaching tonight, and that you would uh, just give me uh, clarity of speech and clarity of mind, Father. I, I pray that you would be glorified in all that is said, and I pray that... Uh, we would all be strengthened and edified and encouraged from this passage, Lord, and from what you have to tell us through this passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, it's, it's 2018. I'm a baby, baby Christian in New Hampshire. Um, and we, we went down there to, to plant a church. Uh, to be honest, it was kind of a train wreck, but I was a part of the church plant, so what do you expect? Um, anyways, it was a cold, snowy day in Franklin, New Hampshire. The roads were all well paved. They do a real good job making sure everything's paved up there. They're used to the, to the snow. They don't freak out like we do down here. Uh, and we're, it's time for church, and we're getting ready to head out the door. And we're kind of arguing amongst ourselves uh, about what we should name this new church. And me being the ever comic relief said, well, I think that we should name it the Church of Jerry Duckworth. Well, as I say that, I slip my jacket on and I walk out the door and I hit the steps and my feet fly straight up in the air. I land on my back and slide down the steps. At that time, the pa uh, one of the pastors stuck his head out the door and said, pride goeth before the fall. Uh, and though I was kidding at that time, I didn't want to name the church after myself, I felt like really that was a uh, uh, that story really illustrates that verse and kind of illustrates our passage uh, tonight. When I was looking through Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 50, I was asking myself, what is this about? And I kept, it just kept coming to me, the, the sinfulness of the disciples. And as I tried to do my best Kyle Roach impression and say, okay, what is the root of their sin here? What's the key issue? Uh, their pride kept coming to mind. So as we look at our text today, uh, pay attention to that. Notice their pride and examine your own hearts and notice where there is pride in your own heart. We'll examine our text today in five points, technically four in the conclusion. First, we'll see the reliance of the self-reliance of the disciples. Second, we will see the self-exaltation of the disciples. Third, we will see the divisiveness or the factiousness of the disciples. Uh, fourth, we will we'll see the call to sin. And fifth, the conclusion will be uh, we'll we'll conclude with a parallel passage, which kind of gives the big idea for Mark chapter nine. So. Uh, let us begin by looking in Mark chapter 9, verse 30. It says, They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Now, the first thing I want us to notice is the messianic secret. As they leave, as they pass through Galilee, Jesus is revealing secret information. He's informing them about his death and his resurrection. And he doesn't want others to hear. We see this all throughout Mark. Jesus is keeping his identity secret because the whole goal is to get to the cross to pay for the sins of the world and then rise from the dead three days later. And the, the Jews at that time, they wanted an earthly king. So Jesus kept his identity a secret. 
Now the disciples, even though they're getting this secret information revealed to them, they completely miss it. But notice how they respond. It says, they did not understand and were afraid to ask him. So I asked myself, why were they afraid? Well, I think it was their pride. And if you remember previously, they couldn't cast out uh, the, the demon. They couldn't cast the demon out of the little boy. Clearly, they were self-reliant. They had casted out demons time and time before. But Jesus said, this one is only cast out by prayer. So they had stopped praying and started relying on their own strength. I think they're doing a similar thing here. They're relying on their own knowledge, their own understanding, instead of seeking Jesus for uh, clarification, instead of submitting themselves to God's revelation. And I feel that there are times when, when in our pride, we, we do the same thing. We don't seek clarity. Uh, perhaps the pastors say something that we don't understand. But we refuse to seek clarity because we have this pride within us that causes us to pretend that we know a little bit more than we actually do. Maybe uh, we, 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 we don't seek clarity because we don't want to to look dumb or we're afraid that we'll look some type of way. We'll look, don't do that. Don't do that. No one's going to judge you for the questions that you ask. When the Q&A time come, comes on Wednesday nights, if you have a question, please ask it. Seek clarity. Don't rely on your own understanding. And we do this in other areas of our life as well. We may be facing a big decision in our life. Instead of seeking the scriptures and godly counsel, if we uh, are prideful, we rely on ourselves. We're too prideful to ask others to help us make life's decisions, big life decisions, so we rely on our own understanding. Don't do this. Guys, we're, we're here to help one another. Confess your sins to one another. Open up. Stop being prideful. Admit where you don't understand. Admit where you sin and fall short of the glory of God and ask for assistance. Ask for prayer. Ask for people to come alongside you. Don't let your pride stand in the, in the way as it did with the disciples. Next, we see the self-exaltation of the disciples. Look with me at the text in verse 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one, with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. Uh, here the, the pride of the disciples is, is clearly illustrated again. As they were arguing about who was the greatest. Instead of having a servant heart and wanting to exalt Christ, they wanted to exalt themselves. But notice how Jesus responds. I found this really interesting. He asks them, what are you talking about? Now, we already know Jesus is uh, fully God, right? And he's omniscient. We know that he knows what they were talking about because in verses 35 to 37, he corrects them, even though they kept silent. So the question is, why does Jesus ask this question if he already knows the answer? Well, Jesus wants the disciples to see where they are, admit where they are, and ask for forgiveness. This clearly parallels uh, God in the garden with Adam. Adam and Eve heard God walking in the garden. This is after they sinned. They heard God walking in the garden. And what did they do? They hid. God asks, Adam, where are you? God knows where they are. He's trying to help Adam and Eve see where they are. He's trying to help them see that they are hiding from the very presence of God, their creator, their sustainer, their everything. And in the same way, Jesus here in this passage, he wants the disciples to see where they are and admit where they are and ask for forgiveness. But just as Adam 
They try to hide. They refuse to answer. They stay silent. Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves to cover their nakedness, and here the disciples sow fig leaves of silence to cover their sin. The disciples should have confessed their sin of pride, but instead of humbling themselves and asking for forgiveness, they stayed silent. What about us? When we sin, do we run to God or do we run from him? Do we confess our sin immediately knowing that our loving father is going to forgive us and he's going to embrace us? Or do we seek to fix ourselves up first? A failure to confess our sin, that's the ultimate form of pride. It's a foolish self-exaltation that says we can fix ourselves up and be good enough to be in God's presence. But instead, we we need to understand that on our best day, on our very best day, we are not even close to worthy of inheriting the kingdom of God. And we need to understand that the only reason that we can even stand in his presence is because of the shed blood of Christ. How lowly we must view the shed blood of Christ that we would not consider it a sufficient covering for our sins and that we would sow fig leaves of silence instead. How deformed of a view of God we must have to run from a loving father who would sacrifice his son on our behalf. To fix this deformed view, we need to see who Christ is, which is revealed in this text. Jesus here in this text shows us that he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven because he is the greatest servant. He takes the little child up in his arms to illustrate just that. Children were kind of despised in ancient times as they often are today, sadly. They were often viewed as dirty, filthy, snot-nosed little kids who just couldn't get out of the way and couldn't contribute to society. But notice Christ. He reaches out and takes this little child in his arms. Dear friends, behold the heart of our Savior. He is lowly and humble of heart. He came for the poor and the needy, for the destitute and the broken. There is no sin that you have committed that he will not abundantly pardon. Don't hide your sin as the disciples did. Confess your sin knowing that he will take you in his arms just as he did this little child in the text. Here Jesus illustrates humility and he corrects the disciples. He's he's calling the disciples and us tonight to confess our pride and to turn from our wicked ways. Instead of being selfish, we need to repent and be selfless. Instead of being self-exalting, we need to exalt Christ by putting others before ourselves. Now, we can put others before ourselves in, in, in many ways. Ask yourselves how you can do this. How can you serve your brothers and sisters here in grace better? How can we make the gathering better for others? There's so many opportunities for us to serve here at Grace, and I just want to briefly list a few. You can call and check on people during the week. You can pray for your brothers and sisters during the week. When we have a meal downstairs, stay and help clean up afterwards. You can volunteer to help clean the church or go outside and do groundskeeping. Volunteer to help on security, to drive the van and pick people up. Or you can use your own vehicle to go pick people up. There are hundreds of ways that you can be serving. And if you're not actively serving in some capacity, then you can apply this message tonight by reaching out to one of the elders or deacons and asking them what you can do. Furthermore, Jesus is teaching the disciples and us that to be a true Christian is to trust in Christ and to follow his example by serving others in his name. And Jesus specifically points out the child to emphasize that we need to serve those who are considered less than in our society. And in doing so, the text says, we receive God. We receive God in the sense that we experience more of God as we become like him. John Piper puts it this way. 
I'm calling you to stop chasing the bubbles of man's praise and start pursuing God. Stop trying to receive praise in the service of men and start receiving God in the service of children. So we've seen the self-reliance of the disciples. We've seen the self-exaltation of the disciples. Now let us look at the divisiveness of the disciples. Look with me in verses 38 to 41. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Now as they're continuing this conversation, uh, we see here in this text, John brings up someone who's casting out demons in Jesus' name. Now, you would think that they would rejoice at that, but instead they tell him to stop. Once again, this seems to be their pride at play. As Philip mentioned when he, when he uh, preached his text, the disciples couldn't cast out the demon. But here, this some random out on the street is casting out a demon in Jesus' name. And that, why do they tell him to stop? Probably because they were embarrassed that they couldn't do it earlier. They didn't want their power and authority to be questioned. However, there's more direct proof of, this pri of their pride in this text. It says, we tried to stop him because he was not following us. The us here is interesting. Does, does John mean that they stopped the man casting out the demon because he wasn't a part of their group? Or because the man wasn't following the group and Christ? Well, I'm not necessarily sure of the answer to that, but either way, his thinking is flawed. The f there is no us. There is just Christ. There is no following us. There is just following Christ. And the fact that this man's doing a mighty work in Jesus' name indicates that at least in some sense he's a follower of Christ, yet they rebuke him anyways because he wasn't following us. This sort of divisiveness is all too common in the body of Christ. Oh, you aren't reformed, huh? You aren't one of us. Well, maybe you should just shut up and go sit down somewhere until you figure it out. Oh, you hold the what eschatology? False teacher. Nobody needs to listen to you. Now, that kind of thinking is absolutely ridiculous because we are anathematizing orthodox members of the body of Christ simply because we disagree on secondary or tertiary matters. It's all pride, pride, pride. Everyone needs to be like us. Everyone needs to follow us. Jesus rejects that sort of thinking. Jesus died to create one new man. There is no Jew and Gentile. There is no Reformed team or Armenian team. There is only one team, and that's the Christian team. We are one because of the shed blood of Christ. Jesus then says, the one who is not against us is for us. Uh, to contextualize this and put it in, in our time and kind of apply this, it's basically saying we need to partner with other level-headed Christ followers to further the kingdom. In doing so, Jesus says we will have a reward in heaven. He says even if it's as simple as giving a, another Christian a glass of water, there will be a reward in heaven. Finally, after examining the sin of the disciples, Jesus gives them the call to kill their sin. Look with me at verses 42 to 50. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. 
And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now Jesus begins verse, in verse 42 with the seriousness of the self-exaltation and divisiveness of the disciples. In overlooking the children and others who are despised by society and rejecting others because they don't follow us, what we're doing is we're inevitably pushing them away, which is causing them to sin. Now, yes, this goes for all other ways that we can cause our brothers and sisters to sin or to stumble as well. However, in this text, it's mainly focusing on the pride of the disciples. And when we cause our brother or sister to sin, when we cause them to stumble, Jesus says it's better as if a millstone, a huge heavy weight is tied around our neck and we're chucked into the ocean and we drown. Jesus is illustrating for us the seriousness of this sort of sin. And in doing so, Jesus calls us to seriously cut it off. He says that our fervor in killing sin ought to be so great that it's like plucking out an eye or cutting off a hand or sawing off your foot. It's a painful process, but better to suffer temporary pain than eternal Better to endure the suffering of killing sin than suffering the fires of hell. Look with me at verse 49. Everyone will be salted with fire, it says. This points back to the Old Testament where every sacrifice was offered with salt. What it's saying here is believers are now the living sacrifices and are being purified through the fire of sanctification. Notice the contrast here. There is a hell fire and a fire of purification. Tonight, I ask you, which one would you choose to endure? Notice that at the beginning of the chapter, the demon that possessed the boy would cause him to throw himself in the fire. That's what the demons of hell want for you. They entice you with sin, promising pleasure, when really they want to watch your flesh boil in the fires of hell. To fight back against these demonic forces that want to entice us, we must kill our sin. So how do we do this? How do we, how do we tear out our eye and cut off our hands and feet? How do we kill our sin? How do we put our sin to death? I want to give you 10 practical tips that have helped me and I pray will help you. Number one, consider yourself dead to sin. Romans chapter 6. You have been crucified with Christ and your old man is dead. Believe and hold firmly to that truth because it doesn't hurt as bad to pluck out your eye or cut off your hands if you're already dead. It doesn't hurt at all. Consider yourself dead to sin. Number two, keep your eyes on things above. Focus on eternal things so that when temptation approaches, you can view your situation from a heavenly perspective. Three, confess your sins to one another. Don't be too prideful to ask for help. We're here to support one another. We need each other's help. Four, renew your mind through God's word. As we take in God's word, it transforms our hearts and minds, which helps us to desire what God desires. Number five, take every thought captive. And I know that that is um, really in the context dealing with apologetics, but the, the principle applies. Take every thought captive in your own mind. Don't let the thought of sin linger, but immediately when you're tempted, shift your perspective and force your mind to think of Christ exalting things. Six, understand that God always provides a way out when temptation occurs. 
So when you're tempted, look for that way out. Matter of fact, understand that you're going to be tempted and plan ahead. No, okay, if I'm, uh, if I'm tempted in this area, what's my escape hatch? You need to have it planned out. Number seven, fight back with the sword of the Spirit. Memorize God's Word so that when temptation comes, you can fight with the objective truth of His revelation. Eight, pray without ceasing. Make times of intimate prayer a pattern in your life. And make conversation with God a constant part of your day. Nine, stir up holy affections. As emotional creatures... We must stir our hearts to desire the things of God. Do whatever you got to do to do that. Listen to sermon jams, music, read the Puritans, whatever you got to do to stir up those holy affections. And number 10, look to Christ as, a, as your greatest joy. Learn to be captivated by Christ. Fall in love with him over and over again. Learn to grasp the fact that your joy, everything that you need and desire can be found in Christ. And as you realize this, your desire for sin will decrease as your desire for Christ increases. Jesus ends this discourse by saying, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now, salt is a purifying or a preserving agent. In other places, Jesus calls believers the salt of the earth. We are to purify or preserve the earth. Now, in and of itself, salt cannot lose its flavor. It's, it's impossible. However, salt harvested from the Dead Sea it had many impurities within it and other minerals. And um, eventually, if you... If you uh, pulled it from there and it had too many impurities and minerals it would cause the the salt to taste more like the impurities than actual salt so the illustration here is that a consistent and unrepentant love of the world shows that someone isn't a true believer they're not pure salt Jesus is calling the disciples and us to put to death our love of the world, to kill our pride, kill our desire for power, kill our divisiveness, and to prove that we are true salt or believers in doing so, and to live at peace with one another. Finally, I want to conclude by looking at the big picture of Mark chapter 9. Remember, the, 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 the theme of the book of Mark is the authority of Christ. We're getting a big picture of who Christ is. Notice how chapter 9 begins. Jesus is transfigured on the mountain. He's giving the disciples a glimpse of, of the glory that he had before he took on flesh. He then descends the mountain, and teaches about his death and resurrection and having humility. Jesus, as the truly greatest in the kingdom, is the perfect example of how we ought to follow him in humility and self-sacrificial love. Though he was God and full of glory and power, he humbled himself, became a man, and died on the cross for the sins of the world. We see a clear parallel of this in Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 to 8 where Paul writes do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The call tonight is for you to kill your self-reliance, kill your self-exaltation, kill your divisiveness, kill all sin by looking to Christ who gave himself for us. Understand that you have been crucified with Christ and that you are dead to sin. Those sinful desires are a part of the old man. Don't let them linger, but look to Christ who will take you in his arms like he did the child in this passage. 
looked to Christ who had all authority and chose to use that authority to serve the lowly and destitute. Seek to emulate him. Be so consumed with Christ that the passionate love that you have for him burns away all dross and impurity. Let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for the text tonight. And I, I pray that you would help us to apply it so that you would be glorified in our sanctification. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother.